mindfulness as I study it and have been studying it for over 30 years is a remarkably simple process of noticing new things. <laughs> everybody and welcome to the pre-accident podcast i am todd conklin and i guess i'll be driving the bus today for this little tiny hoo-ha that we're having that we call the pre-accident podcast friends of the pods welcome if you're a first-time listener well now that sounds perfect if you're a multi-time listener then even better still because Welcome back. You pretty much know what you're going to go into. Today's really interesting. So let me start with a question. When you think of mindfulness, is the opposite mindlessness? And why does all this crap matter? Well, that's a pretty good question, actually. And it's one we ought to dig into. Because if you followed, or if you are following, or have followed or I guess hope to follow, let's put all three tenses in place there, um, the the literature around high reliability organizations or, or high reliability organizing, there's still kind of a dilemma on what to call that. One of the things that comes up over and over again is this notion of, of mindfulness. And that's what we ought to talk about today because I think that really brings us to a place where, well, <laughs> To be really honest, mindfulness, I'm not sure what mindfulness means. And so I went out and looked. And and in that process, I discovered some amazing stuff. I discovered a, a, a remarkable person who I think speaks greatly around this at a bunch of levels. And that's what we ought to sort of talk about. That, that that's That's kind of the... The premise of, of today's podcast is this notion of mindfulness. So I want you to meet Ellen Langer. And Ellen's really important to this discussion. She's from Harvard. Um, she's a, a psychologist. And she's a psychologist who studied mindfulness a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch. And I want to play Ellen's clip. Um, and Dr. Langer is famous for for really this notion of, of how we think about and how we respond to the world around us. Um, you could, you could really, I mean, as much as it hurts me, and I'm sure I'll get a tongue cramp when I say this, you could probably put the word situational awareness in there, and even come up to uh, some of the same kind of ideas. But I want you to listen to what Dr. Langer has to say, um, and this clip's just a—it's a brief little clip of how she describes the notion of mindfulness to us and that will help us tremendously in uh, in having a little uh, a discussion and, and that's what we want to do so without much more ado this is um a little clip to introduce the notion of mindfulness for our discussion today mindfulness as i study it and have been studying it for over 30 years is a remarkably simple process of noticing new things if you notice new things, what happens is that puts you in the present, makes you aware of context and perspective. Most important is that it reveals that we don't know that thing as well as we thought we did. When you make a decision to notice new things, and for example, when I started painting many years ago, um, in the past I would notice trees, for example. And if you ask me, I would probably say that the trees were green. Once I started painting and I had to decide what green did I want to paint the trees, and I noticed that there are so many different colors green, not just in the paints, but the trees themselves and the shading every hour, every minute actually, as the sun moves across the sky, the colors are changing. And so noticing all of this is very, it's very exciting. Everything changes. Things are not only changing, but they look different from different perspectives. What happens is we tend to confuse the stability of our mindsets with the stability of the underlying phenomenon. We're holding it still, but it's changing. And so what happens, let's say even, you know, we, we buy different things and um, you come to know it 
and you think that there's a way of knowing it fully, after that point you treat it mindlessly so it doesn't provide that excitement any longer. Um, and then you need to buy something else. When in fact the items, the people we know, the things we do, again, are changing and can be um, forever um, interesting to us if we just mindfully engage them. So if you walked out your door and you noticed five new things, you noticed five new things of the person you're closest with, or least close with. You notice five new things about um, the gadget that's in front of you. In each case, as you're noticing, um, you're becoming more excited, happier. Um, you'll also find it easier and easier to pay attention to that thing that you're noticing. Um, as long as you don't do what lots of people do do, which is to notice with the in implicit um, intention of knowing it completely. Because once you think you know it completely, that certainty, which is mindless, leads it to be boring and um, leads you not to feel any reason to re-engage it. Um, we ask teachers, what do you mean when you tell your students to pay attention? Um, almost to a one, they say, hold the image still, as if one is looking through a camera. Then we ask all these students, so when your teacher tells you, pay attention, focus, concentrate, what is she telling you, or he, um, they say the same thing. There's, there's no lack of communication. The message is, hold the image still. The message that's received is, hold the image still. It just is the wrong message. So we took children who were diagnosed with an attention deficit disorder, the elderly, who some people I think mistakenly see as having difficulty paying attention, and we took Harvard students who are supposed to be um, too good to uh, show any improvement. And we had them pay attention where we assumed that what they were going to do was hold the image still versus a mindful attention where they were noticing new things. And what happened is when they were noticing new things, um, their intention, attention improved across the board. So, um, when I talk about mindfulness, uh, very often somebody will ask me, well, how does mindfulness, as I study it, compare to, let's say, Buddhist mindfulness? And first thing to recognize is that they're not at odds with each other at all. One can do both. But Buddhist mindfulness, um, basically all um, meditation techniques are designed to increase post-meditative mindfulness. Mindfulness, as I study it, which comes from a Western scientific perspective, is basically um, immediate, rather than meditating in order to get there. We have lots of people who say things like, be in the present, which makes me smile, because while it's sweet, I think it's a facile instruction, because when you're not in the present, you're not there to know you're not there. But the way to be there is um, its the essence of engagement. So it feels good. You notice new things that connects you with the thing that you're noticing. Um, and my research and research that my students and I have done suggests very strongly that it's literally and figuratively enlivening. So what is it that makes this interesting to us, uh, practitioners of kind of a new view, a new philosophy, a new paradigm for understanding success and failure, understanding how reliable systems remain reliable? Well, that's where you get into Carl Weick and, and Kathleen Sutcliffe and, and the people who talk about um, uh, this notion of being highly reliability and that, that a fundamental foundational plank of this – is that highly reliable operations are mindful. They do things mindfully. And that's where this gets really interesting. So let me tell you what brought me to Ellen Langer. And, and the answer is really interesting. What brought me to Ellen Langer is, is this quote, error in one context is success in another context. And what Dr. Langer really says over and over and over again, and that clip I think was a really good introduction into how she's thought about this for 25 years is that we have to be able to distinguish between the universal uncertainty and the personal uncertainty. Now that sounds a little fluffy, but it goes right back to her definition of what mindfulness is. 
mindfulness is is actually by her academic definition is is really all that's necessary to be mindful in the job you do is to seek out create and notice new things and this idea that we give the world a sense of permanence and that it's fixed like when we do an audit you know it's it's fixed in time or the way we think about risk if we do good hazard assessment We'll identify all the hazards, then we'll mitigate those hazards, and the problem will go away. What what Dr. Langer would say is that's not a mindful way to think about hazards. That's a mindless way to think about hazards. Mindfulness and mindful thinking is constantly seeking context. Because mindfulness, looking for really what's new, noticing new things, is constantly changing the frame in which the event, be that work or a near miss or an accident or a failure, where the event um, is happening. You must notice context and you must notice really this idea of perspective. The problem is, is we live in a world that wants to put us and the work we do and the workers who work with us in this kind of absolute frame. So, and it's really overly simplified. The worker's either good or bad. That task is either right or wrong. That behavior is either safe or at risk. You know all these words. And that simple oversimplification, that simple bimodal framing, actually causes our organizations, but more importantly, causes the people in our organizations to respond to the world mindlessly. In a way, you could make a pretty good case that procedures don't create mindfulness, procedures create mindlessness. Because we constantly ask people to ignore variability, ignore what changed, and do what's on the sheet of paper. Now that's a big part of what we think about and and where we go. But I want you to think about mindfulness as an operational strategy. And we know that mindfulness really creates operational flexibility. Seeing things from a different perspective creates new knowledge, which then allows the operations to be smarter because they know more, which then allows them to respond better, quicker, faster to the event that takes place in a way that's actually more towards the notion of resilience. We're moving And this is what Dr. Langer, and and she's got this thing called the Langer Institute. We're moving, really, from a model that there is one right answer. We have to know that, that behavior that we see exhibited actually always makes sense from the actor's perspective, which then allows us the opportunity to go in and dig deeper and understand what's going on, the the chance to, to learn more. And remember, all that's necessary to create mindfulness is to seek out, create, and notice new things. That's not a very fluffy definition of mindfulness, to seek out, create, or notice new things. Mindlessness is really using yesterday's problem-solving techniques or yesterday's solutions for today's problems applying old answers to new questions. And that, I think, for us, in the work we do, and in the world we live in, that's everything. Mindless approach to operational stability is using yesterday's solutions for today's problems. Now, that takes us to a place When you think about a highly reliable operation or a highly reliable organization, that organization practices mindfulness. When you think about the the, the term operational excellence, what we're really defining is Dr. Langer's definition, her, her idea around mindfulness. Operational excellence is pretty easy to define. It's the ability for an operation to constantly learn from itself and improve, right? That takes us right back to the idea 
that we're not using yesterday's answers to, to solve today's questions. We're actually using today's answers to solve today's questions. And we do that using the ability, remember, all that's necessary to create mindfulness is to seek out, create, and notice new things. So where does this take us? Well, there's two questions that Dr. Langer brings up again and again, and they're questions that I think we've used before. The first one is ask this question. When faced with uncertainty, ask, is this a tragedy or an inconvenience? That allows you to seek a framework by which you view the problem and to manage that framework before you actually start viewing the problem. Remember, evaluation of processes, evaluations of operations, evaluations of people, evaluation always exists only in your head, not in the actual thing you're evaluating. So you place value on what you're looking or observing, looking at or observing. That happens in a process in your head, not in the actual thing you're evaluating. We really have to think very differently about how we manage really the work we have because our systems generally encourage a mindless, almost rote compliance response to the world around us. When in fact, what we want is not a mindless response, but a mindful response. And we know that's important because the data that came out of HROs tells us fundamentally that mindfulness is everything. So what do we do with this? Well, the second question that Dr. Langer posits is this one. Ask how. Now, for years, I've pushed people away from asking why to asking how. Because in my opinion, it gives you a deeper, more context-rich understanding of how the actor, the worker's behavior, made sense to them given the circumstances that are around them. But I'm starting to see as we go on this journey together that how really is more ask how it could be otherwise. Ask what other things could exist to create an environment where that outcome was feasible and possible. Our problem is we create theories to explain what happens, and then those theories become compellingly accurate when we go out and look at what happened because we actually find the theory that we created and confirm that theory in our evaluation and observation. Mindfulness is possible. And and what's funny, you guys, is I I would have told you when I first started reading the the stuff out of HRO, uh, the the stuff that was coming out of of Berkeley really early, or or Carl Weick stuff, I would have told you that mindfulness is more of a fluffy, esoteric, spiritual journey that the worker would go on. But I realize now in a more empirical, more scholarly, more practical sense that what mindfulness is, is really the ability to understand context. And every single thing exists in context. All that's necessary to create mindfulness is to seek out and notice new things. That's the podcast for today. What do you think? (laughs) I hope I didn't lose you. My goal in this podcast was to introduce um, Dr. Langer and to introduce the notion of mindfulness in a way that gave us a little bit of academic underpinning for it. Because when you use the word mindful in your workplace, it's not going to have that same academic underpinning. And and really, that definition that that, um, Dr. Langer uses is, you know, mindfulness is essentially seeking new things. That's actually 
quite valuable. And, and, and if you think about it uh, in the way you do your work, you it makes sense. You, you know where this happens. I, I was uh, recently on an investigation and I was working with a, a, a guy who is a remarkably great investigator. And he took a moment with the team as we walked up to do a site tour of, of where the event happened. And he said, before we walk up there, here's what I do. When I walk towards the site, I'm constantly eyes on a swivel, head on a swivel, constantly looking around and trying to notice everything I can notice as I walk towards the site. And what's interesting is that's exactly what Dr. Langer would say is a mindful approach. It's, I mean, that's, that's, that's completely her definition. And I know without using the word mindful with Jim, the guy who was saying this, that when he approaches a site, he's doing it purposely and deliberately under the ability and the guise to identify new things. And, and that's a mindful approach. The question I would ask you is when you go to the field to look at workers, are you going to the field um, with your head on a swivel to notice new things? Or are you going out to confirm old things? Are you using yesterday's solutions for today's problems? And that is the reason I thought this warranted some time together. It, it, it really changed the way I thought about the word mindfulness. And I hope it changed you or at least whet your appetite so that you'll go out and, and explore this. Look her up. There's a million things. TED Talks. I mean, it's, she's, there's a ton, a ton, a ton of information on this. And it's now, at least in our world, really coming to the forefront in the way we think about really operational excellence. Because if I were to redefine operational excellence yet again, and I'm sure I will, it would be the ability for an operation to go out and observe work and identify new things, right? Constantly seek really new things. And that novel approach changes the way you see the context, which changes how you understand perspective, which changes how you understand the, the behavior of the workers or the actors that are in the, in the field doing the work. That is, is everything. And, and her last words, it liter literally and figuratively changes the, the outlook of the world. It's true. It's true. A mindful approach, actively seeking novel, new, creative differences, that makes you, it just makes you that much more aware of the context. And as our friend Shane Bush would say, everything is about context. In fact, if you looked at Shane Bush's license tag on his vehicle, it says context, which I'm sure in Idaho probably drives people crazy. But Shane, good on you for doing that. That, my friends, is what we're talking about. And I think that's a really interesting and very fun description of mindfulness in a non-threatening, academically-based way. I didn't talk to you about being freaky or being present or holding your fingers together and saying the word "um." I talked to you about being able to identify new things in order to understand context. That, my friends, is the podcast for today. Be brave. I think we're in a world that requires courage right now. I hope you get what you need as well. Um, learn something new every single day. And I'll bet you did today. If you gutted through this podcast, I bet you did today. Uh, have as much fun as you possibly can. And for goodness sakes, be safe. Good goes around and around and around. Good goes around and around.